Thank you all for joining us again for today's Bible study. Um, shall we pray? Heavenly Father, we thank you again uh, for allowing us to um, open thy word and um, look onto thy word. Uh, Heavenly Father, the word is the lamp unto our feet uh, and uh, help, help us to walk this life uh, as we are walking in the wilderness, just like Israelites walked in the wilderness for 40 years. Assist us as we go through these scriptures and give us wisdom uh, to preach the truth and nothing but the truth. May it be that it will be glorified and we will um, also learn about your salvation plan and about um, our accountability, Lord. Uh, assist us and be with those that are that are not here with us today and may you bless them and, and their lives. We pray in the name of Jesus. Amen. All right, guys, thank you again for um, um, participating today. Uh, we are looking at the fourth lesson in the Book of Ruth. Uh, and I want to start with um, a couple of, um, um, couple of uh, background info and also um, um, and, and a re reminder of what has happened so far. Um, we have seen that um, in the Bible, um, we have seen that God has written the Bible in a way uh, like a parable. Uh, we see that Jesus himself speaks in parables. Uh, after um, Matthew chapter 13, we see that very clearly. We also see that um, um, in the scriptures, um, Jesus does uh, uh, talk about why he speaks in parables. Uh, and the reason is that he, in Math Mark chapter 4, we, we, we are told through the scriptures that there, there is a um, a mystery of the kingdom of God hidden in these verses, in these stories. And our job is to find that um, and, and find those with the help of the Holy Spirit. The Bible says that to you it has been given to know the mysteries of the kingdom of God. But to them that are without, all of these things are like parables. So when Jesus was speaking in parables, he is trying to reveal in those stories some heavenly meanings. Same as the Old Testament, although it's not parable like a story, but it's a historical event. Uh, God uh, spoke to us uh, in the Old Testament, and God has written the Bible, as we know clearly. Uh, and we know he used people uh, to do that. But at the same time, he wrote it as a historical event. These events are not there for us to just think Bible is an accurate book. These events are there because God in them has hidden uh, spiritual truths as well. You remember the two disciples that were going to Emmaus after the crucifixion of Christ. Jesus, when he appeared to them, he opened the Bible to them. He opened the scriptures to them uh, by going to Moses, by going to hymns, by going to, I mean, to Psalms, and by going to the prophets. And he showed uh, to them about himself. So we know that Moses did write about Jesus. Uh, we know that uh, David did write about Jesus. And in those parables, in these stories, are hidden the mysteries of the kingdom of God. And so as we look at these stories, we are not um, uh, going to go, you know, word by word, and, and try to analyze every word and try to get a spiritual meaning out of it. But as you look at a historical event with the background of it in the scriptures, we are trying to learn, especially in the book of Ruth, some spiritual truths that will impact our spiritual life. In these books. So as we look at the book of Ruth, um, we see few characters in the beginning, especially uh, Naomi and Ruth and Elimelech, uh, who was the husband of, uh, of Naomi. And they make a decision, or he makes a decision, to come out of Bethlehem, Judea, and go to Moab, a, a country uh, that is, we will get into it in the next couple of weeks around what that really was and how, was, how that was created. Um, what I wanted to do is um, 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 
review the lessons of of last week with you just quickly before we go to before we go to the um, to the lesson. So we see in the life of Naomi and the life of Ruth uh, many crises, crisis after crisis. I just have picked six of them at a high level and to show you now. We end up in crisis because we make the wrong decision. Uh, we make these decisions in our lives and, and, and they are not according to the will of God or the word of God. And then we figure out, oh my gosh, what are we going to do? Uh, and so in the first part of this book, I want you to 100% focus on the fact that we are accountable for who we are and what we do. We are accountable. And therefore, we cannot escape the fact that, that we are sinners and we are accountable for the sins that we commit. And we have to answer for those. Uh, either Christ will do it for us or we will do it. But somebody is going to answer the sins, okay? And so as you look at the book of Ruth and, and uh, Naomi, uh, the, 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 the key uh, character in the book, you see that they lived in a very political, corrupt world. Uh, but then we learned, no matter where you are, God can save you. That's a real lesson for us. Anyone, anywhere, whatever condition you're in, God can save you. We also saw that the family faced materialistic problems. They have so many problems without food, without this, without that. And so we learned that God does correct his children because he loves them. He, he does. Um, he does um, chasten us and chastise us. Why? Because he loves us, and we've studied that, right? Um, and he puts us through these scenarios so we come out of it much stronger. Uh, we learned that the family experienced unbelief in the promises of God. They, they weren't focused on the promises of God. They were just looking at the world as a physical thing, right? I have to make money, I have to work now, does the end justify the mean? Does it mean that however I can get money, I should work in those things that I should not be involved with? And so they experienced some unbelief in the uh, promises of God. And what we learned is that we have to believe in the promises of God. We have to believe, otherwise we will not have eternal life. Otherwise we will not have faith and so forth. The family experienced death. Uh, and we also have to understand that we cannot escape death. You and I will die one day. We will not escape it, okay? Nobody can escape it. Nobody has. And by the way, Jesus rose Lazarus from the dead after four days. Where is Lazarus? He's dead. You see what I'm saying? Uh, so people will die. And uh, we need to accept the fact that we will die. And the question we got to ask is this. Am I ready to meet my uh, my savior or not? Am I going to uh, have a uh, have have Jesus Christ standing on my behalf uh, and proclaiming the work that He did on my behalf or not? Or am I going to have to carry that burden, which means I will end up in hell? Right. So death is for everyone. We cannot escape it. And we saw that uh, uh, the family when they were in the foreign land, they made some decisions to marry uh, two people that were uh, not believers, okay? And so the lesson we learned from there is this. We should not look like the world. We should not act like the world. We should not smell like the world, right? Uh, if it smells like a dog, acts like a dog, barks like a dog, then it must be a dog. We cannot do that. We, we have to be Christians living in the world, but we have to be separate. And that's very important. That's the, your character, my character, the way I behave. And I believe you me, I've learned so much in, in the last, especially five years, about this specific topics. Is that how is it that you will learn and live in this world, but be different uh, to bring glory, glory to God? And we should never look like the world. And then we saw that uh, uh, the, Naomi was in despair because everybody is gone. All she had left was some graves and with 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 a lot of uh, nothingness, and so, and the the lesson we learned, I believe, is that um, we cannot depend on our own strength. You know, all of these are good. 
you should depend on your strength because you have to work, but not when it comes to spiritual life, not when it comes to dealing with God. Your strength it will never be bigger than a Pharisee's strength or Sadducee's strength. Uh, so therefore, we, we cannot just rely on what I will do to gain uh, heaven. There is nothing you and I can do to gain heaven. You know that. Because if there were, guess what? We would have already done it. We don't need Jesus, right? We would have already done it. So quickly in Assyrian. Okay, so now, as you look at the crises, we now go to verse, uh, verse 6 of Ruth, chapter 1, and I want to shift now to a different kind of a mindset, and I call it total commitment, total commitment. And, and as we see what happens to Naomi and with, his, with her two daughter-in-laws, you will see some things that are kind of coming to the forefront uh, in chapter one, okay? So chapter one, verse six, Ruth Kiparin Khajagidishta. Then she arose. This is after everybody's dead. There's nothing for her to in that Moab country. Then she arose with her daughter-in-law that she might return from the country of Moab. For she had heard in the country of Moab how that the Lord had visited his people in giving them bread. And so something happens in her life. Naomi is returning to Bethlehem. And the first picture I want to ask you is why? Why is she returning to Bethlehem? Well, the answer is in verse 6. Naomi was returning to promised land. Why? Because the famine was over and she had heard something. What's she hear? That there is bread in Bethlehem. There is bread in Israel. So she is returning to Bethlehem. She is returning to Bethlehem because she knows that's the only place she will survive. In this foreign country, she is a widow. Nobody will help her. But at least if she goes back to Bethlehem, there must be some a, a, a relative of hers there. There must be somebody that know her because she lived there all her life. Okay, that will help her, right? And so she packs up and goes on her way back to Bethlehem. Now, she is not going to Bethlehem because she is missing the fellowship of the believers, no. She is not going to Bethlehem because she wants to spiritually nourish her soul, no. She is not going to Bethlehem because she wants to worship God. She wants to make sacrifice. It doesn't say that. All she says here is that she's going to Bethlehem because there's bread in Bethlehem and she will not die. You see how God works in marvelous way, even though when we don't know what we're doing, the hand of God is there. We, she is going there because if she doesn't go, she will die physically. But God is going to work it in a way that he is going to create something wonderful and awesome from Ruth. Uh, from Ruth that will be saved. You understand? God is creating something. Even though the decision to return to promised land was the right thing to do, her motivations were wrong. You see what I'm trying to say? The motivation is wrong. The motivation is only me, myself, and my body, which I need to live and survive. Great. But the motivation is wrong. And I see myself always making these decisions only based on um, based on physical needs of this world not based on eternal needs uh, that i will need to have you understand and so she gets up and she wants to go back because she has heard there is bread in the promised land now 
she came to her senses, I guess. Sometimes it takes a lot to wake you and I up, to get up and go. And although, again, she doesn't know what's going on, but God is going to bless this event, and he's going to create a marriage in, in, in Bethlehem where Jesus Christ will be born uh, from the marriage of Ruth uh, and Boaz, okay? And we will see that in the next couple of weeks, where he will be born through this lineage. Amazing, isn't it? It's amazing. In Matthew chapter 1, verse 5, you read that, and Salmon begat Boaz, Boaz of Rahab, and Boaz begat Obed and of Ruth, and Obed begat Jesse. Okay? This is, and Jesse was who? David's father. So what we see is that, that uh, Ruth is, become, is going to be the great-grandmother of, of David, King David. But in this scenario right now, when they are dying, huh, they're just trying to survive. But we see the fingers of God at work. It's amazing, right? Sometimes we make so, such bad decisions in our lives that we deserve to be annihilated or destroyed or punished. But we see the fingers of God in our lives. How merciful is he? How gracious is he? How much love does he have for you and me that he died for you and me on the cross? Amazing, isn't it? And so she comes to herself. Open to Luke chapter 15 with me. I want to show you an illustration from the prodigal son. While you're doing that, I want to make some comments in Assyria. in Allah, the plan shall you then cry out, and happened in a culta in a labulanilla gibbet yan, oh, but Hazakdaha la Pelhan, you hated the Hakiba. Okay, I hope you open to Luke chapter 15, verse 14. I'm going to read some verses for you because, in this sense, uh, we see also that this prodigal son was also decided to do the right thing, but he had the wrong motivation. I want to show you this. And when he has spent all, this is verse 14 of Luke 15. And when he has spent all, this is the son that left, you know. He had a bunch of money, stocks, everything, gold, silver. He sold it, melted, and he had party all years long. And, and all of a sudden, there's a famine. And when he has spent it all, there was a mighty famine in the land. And he began to be in want. Oh, boy, now I need. I need help. I need money. I need a paycheck. There's nobody helping me. And he went and joined himself to a citizen of that country. And he sent him into the field to feed swine, pigs. And he, he would fain, he, and he would fain have filled his belly with the husks that the swine did eat, and no man gave unto him. Yeah. So it is as if he's out of a job, there is nothing for him to do. The only place they could put him was taking care of the, the pigs, and he was so in need that he was eating the food with the pigs in this dirt and mud with the swine. Verse 17, and when he, be, he came to himself, just like Naomi, when she came to herself, uh, he said, how many hired servants of my father's have bread enough and to spare, and I perish with hunger. And he's comparing. Not only, he's not comparing himself to the father, not only to his brother, no, that's too high for him. He's comparing himself to the paid servants, those that come, work, and get money, okay? They were paid. He says, they are living, and they have so much bread to spare, and I am dying in hunger, right? The reality kicks in. Verse 18, now look at this. Right decision, right? Right decision. I will arise, great, and go to my father. Awesome. And will say unto him, what will you say? Father, I have sinned against heaven. Oh, he's not going to complain. He's not going to say, Father, it's your fault. Father, it's my brother's fault. Father, it was the economy that collapsed. Father, it was this president, that president. This is why I lost everything. No, 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 no. I will arise and go to my father. And what are you going to say? 
I will say it unto him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before you. Excellent so far. Isn't it perfect? I wish us, we could go back and be honest with ourselves. If we have a problem with our parents, if we have a problem with our daughters and sons and mothers and fathers, with love, raise up and go and say, I have sinned against you and heaven. And here's verse 19. And I'm no more worthy to be called your son. I am not worthy because I have sinned against heaven and you. What does he say? Make me as one of thy, which one? Hired servants. What is he trying to do? Do you, do you get that? He has the right decision to go back. This is the right thing to do, but he has the wrong motivation. What is his motivation? He doesn't want to be a son. He wants to work for a living. He says, I'm going to be a servant. You hire me. Let's, let's see. Two denarii a month. How much are you going to give me? At least I will eat bread and not die. You see, the motivation is wrong. Even when we go back to God, now spiritual dimension, when we go back to God, we are trying to negotiate with God. We forgot about grace. That's why the Father says, forget about it. Bring him the best clothes, the ring, the sandals, the belt, the shoes. Bring it to him. He's my son. He was lost. Now he's found. You see, the Father will never hire you as a hired servant. The Father will always take you in as his son. And so he wants to go back, but he wants to get money for what he's going to do. Oh, not with our father. With our father, you call him Abba, father. You call him daddy. You call him my dad. That's what you do. Why? Because he has died for you. He has put the coat of righteousness upon you. He has given you the belt of truth, the sandals that will run towards the truth and preaching of the gospel. That's right. He's going to go kill a lamb for your sake. That's right. And that's Jesus Christ without blemish and without any problems, no sin whatsoever. And so when you go back, don't try to make a deal with God. Go back and say, my God, I have sinned against you. Be merciful unto me, a sinner. You see? Now, what do we learn from this? What's the lesson? The lesson for us all is this. If you want to experience the blessings of God, and I think she wanted to go experience some blessings of physical blessings in this case, bread, not to die, which is normal. And as I said, it's the right decision. If you want to experience now the blessings of God, ladies and gentlemen, we all need to learn to repent before claiming God's blessings. You can't just go back and say, okay, God, you owe it to me. God doesn't owe you anything. Now, let me show it to you from 2 Chronicles 7.14. This is one of my favorite chapters in the Bible. I have a lot of chapters, more than thousands of chapters that are my favorite. This is one of them. 2 Chronicles 7, verse 14. If my people, now look, listen to him, if my people, which are called by my name, they're not called by the Presbyterian Church of Assyria, not by evangelicals, not by covenants, no. If my people, which are called by my name, shall humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then will I hear them from heaven and will forgive them their sins and will heal their lands. You see what I'm saying? You want to enjoy the blessings of God. The first step is for us to humble ourselves. We have to humble ourselves, number one. Pray, number two. Seek his face, number three. And turn from our wicked ways, four. Four things we got to do. We just want the blessing, right? People come, they just want to get healed. People come, they just want to get this. People come, they just want to get that. Right? Positive preaching. Everybody will get whatever they want. All you got to do is say, I can, I can, I can. But the Bible doesn't teach that. The Bible says the first thing we got to do is humble ourselves. Then it says we should pray. Then it says we should seek him. How are you going to seek him? Well, in the scriptures, that's where you seek him. And then turn away from wicked. We cannot have one foot in the wicked, 
and one foot on the, in the holiness and try to achieve both Satan and God at the same time. It will not work that way, ladies and gentlemen. We have to do this. And this is how you get to the blessings of God. If you want God to forgive our sins, if you want God to heal this land, we have to do these things. This is the, this is the equation that God is giving us, the procedure to follow. Psalm 80 verse 3, turn us again, O Lord. Turn us again, O God, and cause your face to shine, and we shall be saved. God, turn me. God, bring me back. God, help me to, to leave my wicked ways. Lamentations 5.21, turn, turn thou us unto you, O Lord, and we shall be turned. Renew our days of old. God, I heard so many of our, our, our friends that come over, over from other countries and says, oh, I wish I had the same feeling I had when I was first saved. Oh, I want to be like that. You know, the Bible says this, turn, thou unto, turn us thou unto you, O Lord, and we shall be turned, and then he will renew our days as of old. You see what I'm saying? God is asking us to humble ourselves and turn from our wicked ways and come to God. And if you can't do it, which you cannot. The Bible says, God, you turn me, and I shall be turned. You see? This is the true picture of repentance. And so if we want to go to God for the wrong motives, how many of us want to go to God because we think if we are in God, our church, our, our business will be blessed, and we will make a lot of money or, or decent money. And so we kind of mentally are thinking just because we're, a believer, then we will have a lot of blessings. You know, it's wrong. It's wrong. Where was the blessing for Paul when they hacked him upside down and chopped his head off? Come on, you know what I'm saying? Where was the blessing? I mean, just think about it. Just think about it. We have to uh, not focus on physical blessings, but on spiritual blessings first. And God will restore the days as of old to us. And so Naomi had the wrong motivation for returning to Bethlehem, but even though she had the wrong motivation, because she belonged to God, God works everything for the good of those that love him, those that are called according to his purpose. All right? And so that's the first lesson. To experience the blessing of God, we need to learn to repent. We need to learn to humble ourselves before we claim the blessings of God. Now, the second picture we see here in chapter 1, as we are going through the story. The second picture is a picture of choosing the world rather than the Lord. And this is something that we do all the time. Let me make comments in Assyrian for a second. Now, second lesson that we see, or the picture we see, that picture of choosing the world rather than the Lord. Now, let me read to you uh, Ruth 1, 7 through 14. Seven verses I will read. I want you to pay attention to me clearly. Ruth 7, 1, the verse 7 through 14. Wherefore, she went forth out of the place. Now, she wants to go back. The two girls are with her, Oprah, Orpah, and uh, Ruth, and her two daughters-in-law are with her, and they went on the way to return on the land of Judah. Everything is good. She's going and on her way. Now, Naomi said unto the two daughters-in-law, she's thinking, right? Go return each to her mother's house. Why are you coming with me? You guys are Moabites. Nobody knows you in Bethlehem. Why don't you go back to where you came from? Because at least over there, you guys will be taken care of. So she, she really loves them. She wants to think what she can do to help these girls out. And the Lord, deal, deal, and the Lord will deal kindly with you as you have dealt with the dead. That means with my boys and with me. The verse 9. The Lord grant you that you may find rest, each of you, in the house of her husband. Then she kissed them, 
and they lifted up their voices and they cried. You know, women cry a lot. So that's what happened. Verse 10. And they said unto her, Surely we will return with you to your people. Verse 11. And Naomi said, Turn again, my daughters. Why will you go with me? There is no reason, logical reason for you to come with me to a country that nobody knows you. Are there yet any more sons in my womb that they may be your husbands? Are you, do you think I'm going to have another two sons so you guys could get married? Is that why you think? No, the answer is no. Turn again, my daughters, go your way. And because I am too old to have an husband, and if I should say I have hope, if I should have a husband also tonight, she says, and should also bear a sons tonight, why are you going to wait until they have grown up uh, so you can marry them as husbands? No, my daughters, for it, it, it grieveth me much uh, for your sakes that the hand of the Lord is gone out against me. Verse 13. And they lifted up their voices and wept again. So what's happening here? Ruth and uh, Orpah are going with her towards Jerusalem. Bethlehem, I'm sorry, Beth, towards Bethlehem, Judea. And uh, as they are going, um, she tells her daughters-in-law uh, to go back to where they came from because, because uh, that is the right thing for them to do, logically. You know, she's not saying something wrong. She is trying to help them. She loves them. She knows how difficult it is to survive as a widow. She knows that. They know that. So she stops her daughters-in-law three times. In verse 8, in verse 11, and 12, she discourages them to come to the promised land, to come to Bethlehem. Go, return again. Turn again. Turn again, my daughters. Turn again. Go. Go your way. Three times. And sometimes I sit and wonder uh, myself, how many times do I send people to go have all sorts of fun? Oh, where do you go in Italy? Oh, you can go here, there. Where do you go in Napa? You can go here, there. Where do you go in South Africa? You can go. How many times we, we tend to uh, send people to every place except asking them, what are you doing this Sunday? Will you join our worship service? What are you doing on Tuesday, Thursday? Will you join our Bible studies? Sometimes we discourage people from coming uh, to, to our church, you know? That's a very bad sign. And, uh, and you know what happens if you come to Bethlehem, right? You're going to be exposed to the gospel. You're going to be exposed to the message of salvation. You're going to be exposed to the truth about God. That's where the living bread is, right? The spiritual Bethlehem. But we kind of don't get excited. We, we don't want them there for whatever reason. We don't, Tuesday, uh, you know, Sundays, you know, we, we have guests for whatever reason. Instead of bringing them with us to church, we sit with them and, and, and talk about all of the stuff that we have to do in the world. Uh, you know, it's a bad example. We got to live in the world but we cannot be like the world. Don't forget that. We cannot be like the world. Amazing, isn't it? Amazing. They lifted up their voices and they cried. And, and Orpah kissed her mother-in-law in verse 14 and left. She says, bye-bye, I'm going. But Ruth uh, like glued onto Naomi. Uh, Naomi insisted, uh, uh, but Orpah didn't. Orpah went back to Moab, and Moab was an idol-worshipping area. Now, what do we learn here as we read this lesson, these verses? Three things. We must never turn away from God. Never. No matter what the circumstances, you and I must never turn away from God. Second, we must never turn away from the promises of God. When God says, I am the living bread, when God says, Bethlehem is the house of bread, and I am the living bread, you will never turn people from coming to Bethlehem, spiritually speaking. 
and then we must never turn back to the world of unbelievers. We don't want to leave the path to God and Christ. We don't want to leave the path of this highway of holiness and end up in the wide road, going to hell, and forsake the narrow road. Cannot. You see what I'm saying? So our second lesson is this, that from looking at Naomi, these three things that I believe are important. Never turn away from God, nor from his promises, and never go back to the world of unbelievers. Never. Never go back. You see, one thing Pastor Otero taught me when I first was questioning, am I saved or not? What he told me was this, Ramayil, God will never leave you where he found you. Never. Will never leave. If you find yourself where you are 10 years after you say you're saved, where you are doing the same sins and participating in the same unworldliness, something is majorly long, you know? But God will never leave you where he found you. Never. You will walk with God, right? You will talk with God. You, you will have a renewed spirit, a renewed heart, a new heart, and you will never be where you were if he has found you. You will find yourself on his shoulders going towards his house, which is heaven, when you're difficult, in your difficulties. Now look at this. Before we were saved in Ephesians 2.12, look what it says. Before we were saved. That at that time you were without Christ. Before I was saved, I was without Christ. You know, Orpah is without Christ. Being aliens from the commonwealth of Israel, I'm separated. I'm a, I'm a foreigner and stranger from the covenants of promise. I don't understand the covenants of God. Those are strange to me. When Jesus says, I have made a covenant with, his, with Abraham, we, we, we don't understand it. Having no hope, we have no hope. When we were not a child of God, we had no hope. We were without God in this world. How, what a terrible place to be. Just look around you and see what happens to places and people that have no God in their lives. Look at it. Look at the chaos. And so before we were saved, that's how we were. Now, 2 Corinthians 7 says this, having therefore these promises, now that you're a believer and you understand the promises of God, dearly beloved, what do we do? Let us cleanse ourselves from all of our filthiness of the flesh and spirit, perfecting holiness in the fear of God. You cleanse yourself, but you got to fear God, not fear the pastor. You cleanse yourself in flesh and spirit. You got to be perfect in holiness because you and I fear God. Why? Because we know him. Why? Because he's given his spirit in us, said renewed spirit and a brand new heart. So we know him now. And what do we do? We in, in his fear, we will cleanse our ways. Little by little, the friends that used to call you will drop off because you ain't going to party with them anymore. You're not going to the places they want to go anymore. Little by little, you're going to find that you are gravitating towards believers. You're going to love spending time reading the Bible and talking about the Word of God, interested to see what the God is telling you. Search the scriptures. Search the scriptures, and you love doing it. Matthew 16, 26. For what is a man that profit is the whole world? If you gain the whole world and lose his own soul, what is it that's going to profit you? If you are the billionaires of the billionaires, but for eternity you will be separated from God and hell. What is that profit? Tell me. That's what it says. What, what is a man profited if, if he shall gain the whole world and lose his, only, his own soul? What is the profit there? There is no profit. Or what shall a man give in exchange of his soul? Moody would have a paidal barnash and alma kulle kanile in a yano talit. What is the prophet? So what is the second lesson? The second lesson for us is that we must never turn away from God and his promises and never go back to the world of unbelief. Never. We need to instead 
wash ourselves with the word of God, clean ourselves with the word of God daily. And we, are, we need to walk to become perfect, just like Jesus is per was perfect, on the way to become perfect holy before him. And one day, one day we will see him face to face and we will be perfect, 100%. Okay? So the first picture was that uh, um, wrong motives to, to return to Bethlehem. The second picture we saw that, that uh, Orpah chose, chose the world, world rather than the Lord, but something is different with, with, uh, with uh, Ruth. Now look at Ruth. You see Ruth's total commitment to Naomi in verse 14 through 17. But Ruth clave unto her. That's 14. Ruth, she loved yet Naomi. And she said, look at her total commitment to Naomi. Thy sister-in-law is gone back unto her people. This is Orpah. And unto her gods. Oh. Very important, right? Going back to your unbelieving world. At least when they were with Naomi and Elimelech, I am assuming uh, they, they didn't leave the ways of the Lord because she sees the promises that God had made and wants to go back to where she came from. So, which is the presence of the Lord, the house of bread, the house of worship, right? But Orpah went back to her people and what? Verse 15, and unto her gods. She was an idol worshiper. And then, why don't you return after your sister-in-law? And Ruth said, entreat me not to leave you. Don't force me to leave you or to return from following after you. For wherever you go, I will go. Where you lodge, I will lodge. Thy people shall be my people and thy God, my God. I don't want to go back to my, my gods. I don't believe in those gods anymore. They don't do anything for me. Your God is my God. Oh, could it be that uh, someone would ever tell you, I want this God that you worship because you are a different person. I love the way you are, humble, Christian, meek, you know, full of love and grace and mercy and kindness. Who is this God you're worshiping? I love this God. You see, Naomi and, or and uh, Ruth uh, had that relationship, and Ruth is saying, I will not go back to my gods. I will go where you go. I will lodge where you lodge. Your people are my people, and your God will be my God. I want Jehovah. I want the Lord. Where you die, I will die. And where will I be buried? The Lord do so to me and more also, if I but death part thee and me. She says, only death will part between you and me. Wow, amazing, right? She glued unto Naomi, glued. Job 14, 17 says, they are joined one to another. They stick together and they cannot be sundered. Just the same language is being used in Ruth 1, um, 1 14. You are joined one to another, right? Joined, came one. That's what these new glues do. When you put the glue between two material, it, it fuses you into one and you become one material. You become one anymore. You cannot separate anymore. Naomi insisted with Ruth also to go back to her idols and gods. How can she insist that Ruth go back to the world? Would you ever ask your children to leave the church and go to the world? Would you ever ask your friends to leave God and go in somewhere else. Wow, amazing. But we do that, don't we? <laughs> when we have worship service, a lot of churches kick their kids out of the church and say, now you go do something else because this worship service is too heavy for you. You cannot understand the word of God. You go, you go to a Sunday school and then you come back after we're done. You just go there and have fun. And guess what? While the worship service is going on, we kick our kids out 
And guess what? When they're 15, 16, they don't want to come to church anymore. You know why? Because they're not having fun anymore. They cannot be loud. They cannot do what they want. They don't understand anything. Don't we do that? Oh, yes, we do that. Oh, yes, we do that. Ruth did not listen to Naomi, praise God. And she made three pledges, strong pledges. She made three pledges. One, she says, your family is my family. Did you hear that? She says, Ruth says, entreat me not to leave you or return from following after you. I want you. I want what you got. Your family is my family. I'm going to come with you. And I want to give you some words of wisdom for those that want to get married. 33% of divorces come from family-related issues. When you get married, you're committing not to that person, but to the whole family. you got to understand that. Families get in the way sometimes. When you marry, you marry the person and the family, especially in our culture. I'm telling you, you marry the person and the family. So she makes a commitment to the family. Second, she makes a strong commitment to God and his people. Thy people shall be my people, and thy God, my God. And she makes a third commitment uh, to Naomi. She says, where you will die, I will die. And I will, bury, will be buried where you will be buried. And to me, these three commitments, strong commitments, fuses Ruth next to Naomi, right? This is a true commitment. This is a total commitment. She doesn't go there to get a job. She doesn't go there to get promoted. She doesn't go there because it pays well. She doesn't go there because they're nice to me. She's going there because she has total commitment to Naomi. And you and I, when we follow after God, ladies and gentlemen, we must have strong commitment. 100% total commitment to identify with God and the people of God, not just with God, and the people of God. Very important. This is what is lacking in our day and age. Our young people are coming to church listening, but they are not uh, showing commitment to be identified with the people of God. That's a problem. Not only you got to be identified with God, but also with the people of God. That's the lesson for us today. Hebrews 10.25 says, Do not forsake the assembly of ourselves together. Together. You and I, as believers, on, on Zoom, on Skype, on whatever it is, face-to-face, -face, whatever possible, do not forsake assembly of ourselves together. Do not. Acts 4.13, Now when they saw the boldness of Peter and John, and perceived that they were unlearned and ignorant men, they marveled and they took knowledge of them that they had been with who? With Jesus. You see, Hebrew says we have to be identified with the people of God. Acts says we have to be identified with God himself. Look at Peter and John. They didn't go to school. They didn't go to no seminary school. They didn't go get a degree, nothing. What did they do? They were just with Jesus. And when they spoke, everybody knew they were not educated, but they were the disciples of Jesus. You see, what's important is do you and I, are we being considered as believers or not when we speak? One more time, Acts 4.13. Now when they saw the boldness of Peter and John and perceived that they were unlearned and ignorant, by the vocabulary they used or by the way they talked. They perceived these guys are not educated. They marveled. Oh, I wish when they look at me, they marvel too. And I wish that when they look at you, they marvel too and say, these guys have been with Jesus. That is the important part. They don't say, look at the muscles of this guy. He bench presses 600 pounds. No. They don't say, look at the way he sings. He's so beautiful. No. They don't say, look at the way he bangs on the pulpit. He must be very passionate. No. They say something different. They had been with Jesus. And that's what our goal should be. That we should be, as believers, identified with God 
and with the people of God. May God bless us, shall we pray. Heavenly Father, as we continue this lesson in the book of Ruth, we ask you to bless us and walk with us as we continue. And may it be that you will reveal your will, will to us and learn from our total commitment that we've made to you. If we are fallen and falling, break us today, humble us so we come unto you. And we pray that you will, uh, you will take us in because you are a God of mercy and God of grace. And you are, you, your word has promised that you shall be our God and we shall be your people. If we pray and if we come to you and humble ourselves and forsake our iniquities and sins. Lord, hear us today because we pray in the name of Jesus. Amen.